Welcome to Somewhere Through Time. This channel is dedicated to people who experience past life memories, those who simply cannot forget. Here, you can share your stories without judgment while remaining anonymous. Shall we begin? Well, grab yourself a cup of tea or coffee and let's begin. Today's story is from Jim Tucker, a professor who studies children who have past life memories. This story is about a little boy named Patrick. Patrick has odd birthmarks and memories that resemble his half-brother Kevin. Thing is, Kevin passed away 12 years prior to Patrick being born. Patrick, a cute little boy with long dark hair and an impish smile, was my first case. He had just turned five when I met him and his family in their home, a compact house in a small midwestern suburb. I was there accompanying Dr. Ian Stevenson, nearly 80, but with curiosity still unabated. Ian was meeting with the family because Patrick's mother had become convinced her son was his deceased half-brother returned to life. Kevin had been born 20 years before. Lisa, a young mother, and Kevin, her first child, were doing well despite her split from his father, until Kevin began limping at 16 months of age. This was intermittent at first, but after about three weeks, he was limping all the time, and Lisa took him to his doctor. The biopsy confirmed the diagnosis of metastatic neuroblastoma, a type of cancer that spreads to the central nervous system of infants and children. Kevin began treatment, getting chemotherapy. He returned to the hospital six months after his first admission. His disease was considered end stage by then, he was discharged and died two days later. Before Kevin died, Lisa had started dating a new man. Following Kevin's death, Lisa soon got married and gave birth to a daughter, Sarah. The couple divorced after four years, and Lisa later remarried again. She had a second son, Jason, and then, 12 years after Kevin died, gave birth to Patrick. She said as soon as the nurses handed Patrick to her, she knew that he was connected to Kevin in some way. She didn't have that feeling when her other children were born, but this birth was different somehow. Lisa said she felt empty after Kevin died, wanting him back every day. When Patrick, her new son, was brought to her, she imagined a weight being lifted as her grief for Kevin was released. While Lisa saw a physical resemblance between the two boys, there was a link that went beyond that. She soon noticed a white opacity covering Patrick's left eye. While his vision was hard to assess with any precision when he was very young, he was essentially blind in his left eye, just as Kevin had been blind in that eye at the end of his life. Lisa also felt a lump on Patrick's head above his right ear, at the same location where Kevin's tumor had been biopsied. Patrick was also born with an unusual mark on his neck. One of the most inexplicable features of the case was that Patrick limped once he got old enough to walk. He had an unusual gait in which he would swing out his left leg. This matched the way Kevin had walked, since he had to wear a brace after breaking his leg. We asked Patrick to walk across the room several times, and he was still limping slightly at age five, even though he seemed to have no medical reason to do so. When Patrick was four years old, he began talking about Kevin's life. The first thing he said was that he wanted to go to the other house. Patrick talked about it for a while and seemed desperate at times to go there. Lisa asked him why he needed to return. Was there a certain toy or clothes he wanted? He answered, Don't you remember? I left you there. She answered, Yeah, but you have me here now. Lisa asked Patrick what their home looked like and he said it was a chocolate and orange. Lisa and Kevin's home, actually an apartment rather than a house, was indeed a brown and orange building. Patrick began talking about events from Kevin's life, coming out with statements at unpredictable times. If Lisa tried to get him to talk about Kevin, he usually wanted no part of it. Later, he might mention him out of the blue. Lisa was getting ready for work one day when Patrick asked if she remembered when he had surgery. After she told him he had never had surgery, he said, Sure I did right here on my ear. 
and pointed to the spot above his right ear where Kevin's tumor was biopsied. Lisa asked to describe the surgery, but he said he didn't remember because he had been asleep. Another time, Patrick became excited when he saw a picture of Kevin. He had never seen it before because Lisa didn't keep pictures of Kevin up in the house. His hand shaking, Patrick said, Here's my picture. I've been looking for that. He was definite as he said, That's me. He also talked once about a small brown puppy that stayed with the family. Lisa and Kevin had indeed kept a dog like that, one belonging to Lisa's mother when she moved into an apartment complex that didn't allow pets. The week before we visited, Patrick was sitting back on the couch and asked, Do you remember when we went swimming? Patrick had never actually been swimming, but described a day when Kevin swam in the pool at his grandmother's apartment complex. He said his grandmother was there along with his sister's father. He recalled how they had dunked the man's head underwater and mimicked the sound he had made as he came up for air. He told us about going to the zoo with Kevin and their cousin. Patrick had been to a zoo once two years before, but not with the cousin while Kevin had gone a number of times. Patrick talked about Kevin's bedroom and its two closets. While Kevin's bedroom actually only had one closet, it had two sliding doors that opened on both ends. Patrick described an apple-shaped water ball, and Lisa said Kevin had a bathtub toy like that. He also talked about going with Kevin to a ranch that had bulls. Patrick had never been to one, but Kevin had indeed visited a cattle ranch that his aunt owned. Several months before we met the second time, Patrick began talking one night as his mother fixed dinner. He asked, Do you know that you have a relative that no one talks about? He said he had met this relative in heaven before being born. He was tall and thin, with brown hair and brown eyes. He told Patrick that his name was Billy, and he was called Billy the Pirate. He had been killed by his stepfather, shot point blank up in the mountains. He said he was upset that no one talked about him after his death. Lisa knew nothing about any relative named Billy. When she called to ask her mother, she discovered that her mother's oldest sister had a son named Billy. The details Patrick gave were correct. Billy had been killed by his stepfather three years before Lisa was born. The murder was never talked about in the family. When Lisa asked about the nickname, Billy the Pirate, her mother laughed. His wildness had led to the nickname, and Lisa's mother said she hadn't heard it since Billy's death. There seemed to be no way that Patrick could have ever heard about Billy or his nickname before. Jim Tucker says, If you are skeptical, I would challenge you to make a final determination only after you've heard all the facts. I will also explore how this phenomenon, beyond being consistent with scientific knowledge, can even lead to new insights about the true nature of reality, both about our existence in this world and about the possibility of life after death. I hope all of us can try to emulate Ian's attitude of maintaining a critical eye, but also an open mind. In this way, you can appreciate the astonishing experiences some of these families have had, and you can consider any meaning to take from stories of children like Patrick, a little boy who may have come to life bearing marks and memories from his dear, deceased half-brother. Well, that's it for today's episode. Thanks for watching. Until we meet again, so long.